So welcome back to our discussion. This is Shoulder Week, also known as Shark Shoulder Week, kind of like Shark Week. We're drilling into the shoulder and we're going to drill further. Earlier on we were talking about the locations medial laterally of rotator cuff injuries. We began with foot plate or footprint injuries that may or may not penetrate bone, so-called rim rent configuration tears that are concealed or hidden. Either word is fine. And when they're somewhat linear and small, we refer to them as CIDs, concealed interstitial delaminations, with or without rim ring component. Then if you have involvement of the rotator cuff right over top of this yellow area, say right here, you'd say there's a small undersurface tear along the bare area of the intraarticular space, a partial thickness tear as long as it doesn't communicate. But we're not into a discussion of depth just yet. Then if you have a tear over here, it would be in the articular surface uh, or the articular surface region of the humeral head, either the lateral articular surface, the apex, or the medial portion. But you're also going to describe the tear not only by its relationship to the humeral head, whose anatomy now you know in excruciating detail, but also by its relationship to the muscle, the myotendinous junction, the cable, the crescent, and the footplate or footprint. So that takes us to our next discussion of the supraspinatus and secondarily we can extrapolate it to the infraspinatus. That takes us to the sagittal projection. So we, believe it or not we're still on the basic discussion of rotator cuffs. We haven't gotten to all the crazy names and all the other crazy stuff we're going to cover and I made my sagittal humeral head really big because I'm not a great drawer and we'll call this A anterior and this P posterior. My P isn't very good. I better make my line a little bit thinner. And now let's get our let's get our rotator cuff going here in purple. Here's the supraspinatus portion of the cuff. And then the supraspinatus portion of the cuff is connected to the infraspinatus portion of the cuff right at about just past the apex of the humeral head is about usually where they transition. We'll make our infraspinatus slow green. So here's our infraspinatus and this area here which is connected by a small fibroelastic membrane which can be very short, can be congenitally longer, or it can acquire stretch out. So it can become longer from front to back over time. When you tear either one of these, you're going to look at depth, which we're going to discuss in a few minutes. But right now, I want to concentrate on the concept of length. When you're looking at depth and length, this concept really resonates more when you're dealing with flat tendons. So depth is obvious. It's going to be this. Length is A to P in the shoulder. So if you tore this entire structure from front to back and you had nothing here, you would say there's a complete. And if it goes all the way through, full thickness, and then you use the coronal to describe the retraction. If it's just the anterior half, then you'd say anterior supraspinatus, and you'd give them the length. So the length might be something like this if the tear is this long, from here to here. If you're missing the whole supraspinatus, you'd say it's complete and it has X length. If it goes into the infraspinatus, you'd say it's got the anterior fibers of the infraspinatus, all the fibers of the supraspinatus, and now it's four centimeters A to P. We'll talk about depth in a moment. We're talking simply about completeness. And then if it goes all the way around back, it's got the entire infraspinatus, the entire supraspinatus. It's a complete infraspinatus. It's a complete supraspinatus. We'll say it's a full thickness tear, the entire thickness of both tendons, and the length is five centimeters. And the humeral head is now bald. And we use that term, bald humeral head. This little spot right here, this fibroelastic membrane in light blue, maybe we need another color, like red. In red, we say it can be a little bit longer. It can stretch out. You can be born with a longer one. But this area is prone to 
micro trauma, micro separation, and because it's very thin and membranous, diffusion. So if you're going to get some diffusion of synovial fluid and fluid into the rotator cuff muscles, it's often going to come from right here. And it'll come out of here as a little tiny thing that you can hardly even see or you cannot see because it's a diffusion event. And then it'll go into the muscle and it'll balloon as it tracks from medial to lateral. And that's known as a cystic tear. And as they balloon, if they trumpet from medial to lateral, let's say it comes out and it gets in the muscle and it does something like this, it's called a sentinel cystic tear. In other words, it has a little blowhole at the very end. The little hole where it comes out of is very difficult to see. Sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't. Very rarely will something like this be a true ganglion that arises from the tendon in the muscle but has no communication with the joint. 90% of the time it came from the joint from a small rotator cuff or rotator interval injury. And We said there are other intervals. There's an anterior interval right here. That's the space between the supra and the subscapularis, which we will make now in blue. We'll make it a lot thicker. Here's our subscapularis. And the subscapularis, unlike these other tendons that fan out and flatten out and blend together and make a mesh of low signal intensity, almost like a net, the subscapularis doesn't do that. The subscapularis usually has four or five dominant tendons inside it, which you can see, that divides it up into various segments. So you don't have to say which segment it is. You just should probably say upper third, upper fourth, you know, middle third, you know, second fourth, whatever. Just be descriptive. The, the clinician really only cares about generalities here. The upper half of it is ruptured. The lower half of it is ruptured. It's a partial thickness tear. It's an interstitial tear. It's a concealed tear. We're going to get to that as a separate subject when we get into subscapularis tears, but that's an introduction to it. And one of the best sequences to diagnose subscap tears is the sagittal projection because you're absolutely perpendicular to this structure, and it's a rather complex structure, as we'll see in a few moments. We also have another interval. That other interval is the deep posterior interval between the infraspinatus and the teres minor. We'll make the teres minor some pretty color like orange. Now the good news here is it's a little like politics and US Congress. Nothing ever really happens here. So you don't have to be you don't have to be too concerned about it. Nothing ever really happens in the in the teres, and not much happens here except one thing. This is a good place to stick your needle when you're doing an arthrogram or an MR arthrogram. It's very safe. It's easy to get into. There's no important structures here that are of biblical or political significance. So you can get in here without a lot of worry, and if you miss, the consequences are usually non-existent or nominal. This is also a great projection to assess where your pits or pseudocysts are and you know they look somewhat like this either irregularity or you actually see subchondral or subcortical cysts and they tell you kind of what's going on physiologically and pathoanatomically with the shoulder so if a lot of these changes are in the front let's pick another color like pink uh, if a lot of these cystic changes are in the front you know that there's going to be contact of the humeral head with the subacromial arch and the acromion when the patient's arm is forward and over the head. Kind of anterior. This is called external impingement. Whereas if most of the pits and irregularities and pseudocysts are in the back near the infraspinatus, remember this is posterior, here's our P, then most of the contact is going to occur in the cocking position. This is called internal impingement. And there's another one. If a lot of these pits and irregularities are deep to the subscap, then there's a pretty good chance you're dealing with subcoracoid far anterior arch impingement, which is the least common of the three. And there's another one called anterosuperior impingement, which is a story for another day. 
So I'm going to stop right now regarding the sagittal projection. You know, that is my story for the sagittal projection. It's the introductory story, but yet it's pretty complex because the shoulder is a ball and socket joint. It's pretty complex. And ball and socket joints are the toughest ones to assess. Let's take a breather. You take a breath. And then we'll come back and we'll continue on with our diagrams.